So we, Ron and I went in, his name is Ron, by the way. Ron and I went in and we started looking around. I'm thinking, looking at these art pieces, I'm thinking, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, how are these called art, you know? That's my impression, because I don't, I don't know art, okay? That's my, my impression. And I was thinking about it. It reminded me of my experience many years ago. About 15 years ago, my brother and two of my cousins, four, four men, took a trip to Europe for about two weeks. And we went to, uh, to Italy, uh, London, uh, Fran uh, Paris, and all these different places. And I remember going to, uh, the, uh, to London, uh, just we were checking out the British Museum, and we went to Paris, and we went to Louvre. And to have a better understanding of the arts there, uh, the four of us decided to uh, borrow, you know, those headsets where it explains all the all the different arts out there. And we remember just going through each uh, piece, each art piece, and there's a number right next to it where it gives you uh, like the history of the art, why the artist, you know, drew or sculpted this way and that. And when you listen to those, it just gave me a clear understanding of how this art came out to be and i think we're going through that 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 process uh with pastor tom throughout the series like my experience today without any explanation i'm looking at this 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 frame i'm thinking what does this mean it doesn't mean anything to me it's just like you know throwing uh just paint out there but when you have a proper description and understanding of why they came up to me, it just makes all sense to, to, to me as well. And so, you know, sometimes when we try to study the Bible on your own, you're thinking it doesn't make sense or it's very difficult to understand. But just going through the series as Pastor Tom throughout the past few weeks, um, it just gives us a clear understanding of what the scripture is. And I praise God that, that, that God has, has used Pastor Tom throughout this, these, uh, this whole month to have, give us a better understanding of the scriptures. So we still have a few more nights to go before we finish off the series, but I pray that, that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide you and lead you as we uh, try to understand what the scripture uh, tells us. We do have a, a question that came in tonight um, uh, from, uh, from our last session on Sunday night, and uh, here is the question. We learned last uh, Sunday, last week, that pork is unclean to eat. But I've heard otherwise based on the following verses. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Uh, Mark chapter 14, verses, chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. And 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. So, Pastor Tom, please explain to us. All right. <clears throat> ignition yet? There we go. Sounds like we have ignition. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 9. Turn your Bibles to that. If you don't have your Bible with you, I could say shame on you, but there should be one in the pew in front of you. So go ahead and pull out what, Acts chapter 9. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read Acts chapter 9 and chapter 10 because really if you just read the two chapters, they are very, very self-explanatory. Okay? So let's just go ahead and do that. <clears throat> it's talking about, uh, uh, this should be talking about Peter's vision. Acts chapter 9. They got the wrong chapters on there. I don't see anything in here that has anything to do with that. This would be the Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 is what it would be. Acts chapter 10, the vision of Peter. I'm going to start in verse 9. Acts chapter 10, verse 9 says, on the morrow. Now, I'm going to start with verse 1 because verse 1 gives you the setting for that. <clears throat> it says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell you what you ought to do. And when the angel which spoke unto Cornelius was departed, now notice very carefully, pay careful attention. If you want to know what the Bible means, you must first know what? What does the Bible say? That's right. We can't read into something, something that is not there. Okay, now let's see what it says. And when the angel spoke to him, uh, spoke to Cornelius, was departed, he called, what's the next word? Two 
of his household servants and a, a devout soldier. How many people now? Three. Okay. That was waited on him continually. And when he declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, the next day, as he went on their journey and drew nigh up under the city, Peter went up on a housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. What did Peter say? Not so, Lord. For I have, how often? Never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice spake on him again the second time. What God has cleansed, that call thou not common. This was done how many times? What's the next word? Three, three times. Three times and vessel was received up again into heaven. Did Peter understand the vision? Next verse. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision uh, which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, how many men? Three men. How many, how many, uh, uh, how many times did the sheet come down? Three times. How many men did Cornelius send? Three times. He said, rise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing for who sent him. God sent him, that's right. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause that you have come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one that fears God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews was warned from God by a holy angel to send for you into his house and to hear words of thee. Then he called them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, the next day, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said to them, now listen, here's the, here goes the punchline. And he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God has showed me that I should not call any man what? Common or unclean. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, and he, and he reiterated that to God. And so Peter uh, preached to them, and then they were, uh, he, the, the Holy Spirit fell on him. He was baptized them. Go to chapter 11. <clears throat> so you see, Peter got in trouble for this because they were still Jews. And there was still a strong prejudice of the Jews against the Gentiles. In fact, they considered Gentiles unclean animals. They referred to them as dogs. They thought they were lower than a snake's belly or like an old cowboy friend of mine said, oh, they're lower than a centipede's arches. You ever seen a centipede? A centipede, you know, those little million-legger things? Go to chapter 11. <laughs> chapter 11, Peter is rebuked by the Jewish Christians. He says, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God when Peter came up to Jerusalem. They that were of the circumcision, okay, contended. They argued with him, saying, you went into men uncircumcised and ate with them. And Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon which, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts and creeping things, and fowls of the air... Where am I lost my place? And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered again, the voice answered again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, call that now common. 
And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come into the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Jop and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby you and all your house shall be saved. Now, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as at the beginning. And then I remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, you shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. For as much as then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then God hath also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now, when he said, I should not call, what, is he, what did he say? He says, um, verse 9, he said, but the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, call that not thou common. And Peter told me, so I'm not supposed to call any man common or unclean. He never said a pig common or unclean. When Jesus died on Calvary, he did not die on Calvary to cleanse pigs to make them clean to eat or any other unclean animal to eat. He died there to save sin. People get that mixed up. Nothing about the physical anatomy of these unclean animals changed at all when Jesus died on Calvary. You know, every creature, and that's another one of another verse. I don't have time to look that up because I'm running out of time here. But <clears throat> it says, every creature of God is good and is to be received with thanks because it is sanctified by the word of God. It is sanctified. It is set apart by the word of God. What animals were set apart? Listen, everything God created was good. He didn't create anything bad. It's all good, but not all of it was intended for food. You know, we seem to think that if it's, you know, that everything should be okay for food. Well, then let's go ahead and we can eat snails and we can eat ants and we can eat grasshoppers. And, you know, uh, snakes ought to be out a lot of fun. You know, I heard that if you drop them in a pan, they kind of wiggle around for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, I mean, that's just because of custom, because of custom or because of our taste buds, we try to make something okay to eat that God said, don't touch it. In fact, he says, it is an abomination. It's an abomination. Don't forget that word because there's an abomination that makes desolate, and you don't want to be handling the abominable things, and I'm out of time. Oh, thank you, Pastor Tom. I think this uh, question and these verses also, once again, remind us of the principle of studying the Bible as we understand the context of it. Um, it helps us better understand what this verse was actually about. Um, so I think it was a good time to just clarify our biblical principles. If we just read the chapter, just read the chapter as it reads, and you'll find out it had absolutely nothing to do with food. It had everything to do with how they consider our people. It was really dealing with a very basic thing we still deal with today, and that is prejudice. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Well, it's time to begin our session for tonight. Welcome back to Prophecy Countdown. I'd like to welcome uh, each one of you for uh, from joining us online uh, from different parts of the state and from different parts of the world as well. We are coming almost to an end here. Uh, it's only a few nights left, but I pray that it was, has been a tremendous blessing for you. And I just want to know, to let you know as a pastor of this church, uh, because a series is stopping doesn't mean that series ends. Our study continues. And this church is open for us uh, for you to study together with us continuously as well. So please keep that in mind uh, as we think about what happens, what takes place after the series is over. And I'll be available for, for each one of you as well. Just let me know. Well, with that said, I'd like to uh, invite Pastor Tom. Uh, tonight's a very important topic, uh, a topic that you wouldn't want to miss. I'm glad you're here. I'm sure the Holy Spirit has spoke to your heart to be here tonight. So thank you for being here tonight. And Pastor Tom, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Myself off. It's not you. <laughs> I clicked myself off. <clears throat> Good to be back. We had a, had a short break up there in Wisconsin, hey, up in northern Wisconsin. You know, another couple of nights, you guys say, Whew, don't have to keep running out night after night after night. So I kind of give you, a, give you a break there for a while. Hey, we got a really, really good subject we're going to be talking about tonight. Tonight, we're going to talk about exposing Revelation Scarlet Harlot 
and Mighty Babylon. Babylon, I want to welcome our folks that are just joining us online as well down here in Waukesha. We're going to look at Revelation 17 and 18. We're going to look at a bunch of other places in the Bible as well, but we're going to see what does the Bible mean by this harlot that's called Babylon, Mystery Babylon. Now, on uh, uh, tomorrow night, Tomorrow night, the most sought-after secret in the Bible revealed. And I'm not going to say anything. I want you guys to be puzzled about that for a while. How are we going to, how is this all going to come together? And then on Sabbath morning at 10 o'clock, we have our pastor's class. Now, if you missed last week, that's okay. You can always come in and join us this week. But we're going to be going through a Bible mark, and we also have a question and answer period. Uh, but we'll, it's a lot more relaxed. I think you guys that were there last week, you realize it's a lot more relaxed than what it was, than what this kind of is. It's not as much of a preaching thing as what it is in actual like a classroom uh, teaching type of thing. And then at the 11 o'clock hour, Revelation reveals the 144,000. There's two places in Revelation talks about this 144,000. We're going to see what does the Bible mean by this and what does it mean for you and me living here now <clears throat> in 2022. And then Saturday night, the New World Order and the United States in prophecy. And that is going to be our last meeting, at least the last meeting with me. Uh, there will be meetings actually continuing on. Matter of fact, I've got the next slide up there. Beginning next Thursday evening at 7 o'clock, an in-depth study of the book of Daniel. Uh, the pastor is going to be leading that, I believe, and it's a very, it's just going to be pretty much like verse by verse through the book of Daniel, not four nights a week, one night a week, make it a little bit easier uh, on you to be able to uh, attend that. <clears throat> I know how hard it can be to be able to come out night after night after night, weekend after weekend, but uh, you can, I think when you see how much material we've had to cover in this, you realize, you know, it just takes a lot to be able to uh, uh, do that. Uh, I am planning on coming back in the fall. Here, I'll be back here in the fall. Uh, we've got a date in September. I think that I'll be back, and I'll be back for one more weekend. Uh, we'll have probably five messages in that. So, and I believe, I, if we've got a tentative date right now. I don't want to give a date right now. We've got a tentative date that I will start that. But anyways, that's an exciting, that is a very, very fun study. I guarantee you one thing. If you go through this study, you will understand more about the book of Daniel than most ministers know about the book of Daniel. I am dead serious. It's very, very in-depth, but it's very easy to be able to follow along. Okay, that's the end of the announcement. Uh, the announcements get shorter and shorter because we have, our time is getting shorter and shorter. We've only got two more nights after tonight. I'm gonna miss you guys. I am. That's, uh, it's been a lot of fun getting to know you and stuff. But anyways, I'm going to go ahead and kneel and uh, pray up here. If you'd go ahead and bow your heads with me. Father, we just <clears throat> thank you again. We've had a, a few nights off. I pray that we've been able to get rested, that our, our minds are ready now to be able to really to dig into your word tonight. And Father, you've got very serious warnings about our subject here tonight. So Lord, I pray, just in a special way, Lord, that you would just fill us, that you'd fill our hearts, you'd fill our minds, you'd fill us place with your presence. And Father, we can focus on the importance of this and that it can be in an understandable way. And that as we see truth, and Father, we'd want to follow that. And so Lord, as I prayed every night, I pray you'd give us those the eyes that we can see, the ears that we can hear, and Father, a heart that we can receive. Father, give us a heart like yours, a heart that, we, that we'd be willing to follow you, that no matter what happens around us, that we would be devoted to you exclusively. And so, Father, bless us now, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's like I said, our subject this evening is exposing Revelation Scarlet Harlot and mighty Babylon. You know, many thinking people today are wondering what is happening within the Christian world. And I really believe it probably began years ago with the discoveries that have taken place concerning the lifestyles of TV evangelists and the immoral conduct of some of the leaders in the Christian world. People are thinking that it's all too representative of much the general condition of the churches today. In fact, Warren Wiersbe wrote his book, The Integrity Crisis, in response to this. You know, there's no doubt the words of the Apostle Paul seem to describe the state 
of much of the Christian world today. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we read there, he said, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, I want you to understand, Paul is writing this to Timothy, but he's writing it to the Christian church. Now, he's not just warning, as we go on, you're going to see, he's not just warning about the conditions that were going to be in the world, because these conditions have, con have happened in the world for a long time. He's warning about what was going to be taking place in the Christian church. So pay close attention as I read this. He says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of of God having the form of godliness but denying its power. He's talking about people that would call themselves Christians. You see, they're lovers of pleasure more than they're lovers of God. He said they would have a form of godliness but denying its power. He gives another warning in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Again, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says to Timothy, this is his exhortation to Timothy. He says, preach what? Preach the word. He said, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. He said there would be a form of religion, but no real power. And so because of that, they would turn to pre preachers who would tell them what they want to hear. They would teach fables instead of the truth of the Bible. And friends, listen, I have to be totally candid with you this evening. There can be no doubt that this is happening today. This is a reason for much of the current problems. Ken Woodward, Newsweek Magazine, Writes concerning, uh, cert, he writes concerning certain proposals of a very large mainstream denomination that if, quote, if the committee has its way, the church will liberate itself and reevaluate its definition of sin to reflect the changing morals of our society. Instead of the scriptural thou shalt not, the church will endorse a passel of thou shalt. So if the church wants to liberate itself, the question we need to be asking is very simply, who do they want to be liberated from? If it's according to what, what Mr. Woodward was writing here, it's not being liberated from the world because friendship with the world, the Bible says, is enmity against God. If, if, it's, if that's what they want to be liberated from, fine. But that's not what they're doing. They want to be liberated from God because they don't want to have God's laws ruling in their lives. This is a, uh, a headline <clears throat> that Christ followers or Christian followers probably hope was stolen from the popular Christian satire site, the Babylon Bee. It is, in fact, very real. This is a, the Living Faith Church down in Little Italy in downtown San Diego, California, describes itself as a Christian charismatic church that is pastored by two entrepreneurs, one of whom is a porn star. Pastor Stephen and Angela De La Cruz met while attending Bethany College of the Assemblies of God, a Bible college where Stephen earned his bachelor's degree in theology and theological studies. Angela is an ordained minister who is also open about actively working in the adult entertainment industry. Now, can you believe this? I mean, I see you out there shaking your heads. I mean, this is, you wonder why people look and they say, what's happening in the Christian world? When you got a porn star, makes porn movies during the week, and then gets up on Sunday and preaches to her congregation. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. This is a headline of a church in Michigan, 3,500-member church, RCA, Reformed Church of America. They gave him roses and a standing ovation because he came out proclaiming that he was a practicing homosexual, that you can't take the Bible literally. <clears throat> You see, no longer are the Reformation churches calling for reform. People follow those who say what they want to hear so they can live like they wish to. They can believe the way they want to. So let's get a prophetic backdrop for all of this. In Revelation chapter 17, 
we find a strange woman riding on a dragon-like beast that has seven heads and ten horns. So who is this woman? And why are we warned about her? What has she done to find disfavor with God? So who is this scarlet woman? Well, you know, today it's amazing that theologians are strongly silent about this today. But there's no need to be because the Bible isn't. So before we find out, we must ask her the, answer the question, what does a woman in prophecy represent? <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, he said, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In Revelation, we have two women that are presented. One is a pure woman. We find her in Revelation chapter 12. That's God's church. You see, the people with the pure gospel of Jesus. Then you have the impure woman. <clears throat> That's a devil's church or false religion at the end of time. Now, like I said, Revelation chapter 12, we find this woman here. She's described there in the first few verses. And then in Revelation chapter 17, we find this other woman. And as a side note, as you're reading through your Bibles, I want you to take notice of the difference in the way these two women appear. One is adorned naturally, the other is covered with man-made adornment. We'll talk more about that maybe on another, on another time. But just take a careful look at that and just see what is the Bible actually telling us here. Now, there's something that I hope the Spirit will impress on you tonight, and that is simply this, that every soul is either in God's system, obeying the commandments of God, or they're in a system of false worship following the commandments of men. And so there is a true church. There's also a counterfeit religion of the dragon. So what we're choosing between is God's truth or Satan's church. Now, some people say, oh, man, Tom, I didn't even know Satan has a church. Let's listen to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9, where he says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are what? And they're not, but they are what? A synagogue of Satan, a synagogue, a church a church of Satan. And as we have seen clearly pointed out in Bible prophecy, <clears throat> Satan is absolutely in the religion business, seeking to bring the whole world into his great apostasy involving the Antichrist power and a great religious confederacy based on error and false worship. Okay, let's take a look at this impure woman. Revelation chapter 17, I'm going to begin reading there in verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and all the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. You can tell by the description, this woman is not one that would be favored by God. In fact, when, when, uh, when someone's referred to as a harlot, that's not actually a complimentary title to be given to someone. He said, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. On her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And so we have this scarlet woman sitting on this beast. Now remember, in prophecy, a beast represents a nation. Now there are two characteristics of this beast. In verse 7 we read, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And so it says that he would have, this beast would have seven heads and ten horns. Now verse 9 tells us what these heads are. It says, here is wisdom, there, here is a mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sets. And the New International Version says this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sets. And so here we find that this church or system of Revelation chapter 17 has the colors of purple and scarlet, and she sits on seven hills. Now what's really interesting is there's only one city in the world that's known as a city of seven hills, and that's the city of Rome. That's the city of Rome. Dave Hunt in his book, A Woman That Rides a Beast, he says this. <clears throat> he says, a woman rides a beast, and that woman is a city built on seven hills that reigns over the kings of the earth. 
Was ever in all of history such a statement made? John immediately equates the reader's acceptance of this revelation with wisdom. We dare not pass over such a disclosure casually. It merits our careful and prayerful attention. Here is no mystical or allegorical language, but an unambiguous statement in plain words, that woman is that great city. There is no justification for seeking some other hidden meaning. What's this thing doing? <clears throat> oh, I know what's going on. That thing's coming in the back. I got to change that. The woman is a city. Furthermore, she is a city built on seven hills. That specification eliminates ancient Babylon. Only one city has for more than 2,000 years been known as a city on seven hills. That city is Rome. Catholic Encyclopedia states, quote, it is within the city of Rome called the city of seven hills that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined. Now, Isaiah chapter 13, verses 19 to 22, tells us specifically that the literal city of Babylon would never be rebuilt and said it would never be inhabited again. And so History of the Christian Church by Philip Schaff, he says, as the Greek church rose on the basis of Grecian nationality, so the Latin church rose on that of ancient Rome and reproduced in higher forms both its virtues and its defects. Roman Catholicism is pagan Rome baptized, a Christian reproduction of the universal empire seated of old in the city of the seven hills. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 7 says, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. Now, the ten horns. Now, we already learned that Rome was broken up into how many different nations? Broke up into ten. Remember that? We saw that. That became the divided nations of Europe. Is that what this is actually talking about? Well, no. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And so the first part rep <clears throat> represents the world union of all the nations in the last days. Now, the ten horns, we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but it could be. The United Nations has divided the world up into ten regions. And so that possibly could be that. I'm not saying it is, but I said that is a possibility. It is something that we need to be watching. Okay? But it also says that the whole world follows the beast. Now, one hour referring to a very short period of time, uh, during the last days, the beast of Revelation 17, the, the dragon or pagan Roman paganism and all the anti-Christian powers of the world that the dragon works through, they will appear to be reigning for that very short period of time. So who does a woman represent? Well, it's another, none other than the papal Roman church and actually just a continuation of the Roman Empire. So it has to be the church supported by pagan Rome, and the woman was sitting, seated upon this beast. That's why it's called the Roman Catholic Church. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 6, says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. And so this would be a persecuting power. We found that it was a persecu persecuting power. It had many martyrs under her hand. From Dave Hunt in his book, The Woman Rides the Beast, he says, pagan Rome, oops, it says, pagan Rome made sport of throwing to the lions, burning and otherwise killing thousands of Christians and not a few Jews. Yet Christian Rome slaughtered many times that number on, of both Christians and Jews. Besides those victims of the Inquisition, there were the Huguenots, Albigenses, Waldenses, and other Christians who were massacred, tortured, and burned at the stake by the hundreds of thousands simply because they refused to align themselves with the Roman Catholic Church and its corruption and heretical dogmas and practices. Out of conscience, they tried to follow the teachings of Christ and the apostles independent of Rome, and for that crime, they were maligned, hunted, imprisoned, tortured, and slain. I want to add here that Dave Hunk, Dave Hunt is not a Seventh-day Adventist. Dave Hunt's an evangelical, and he was caught a lot of flack because this is not exactly the way the ecumenical movement wanted things to go. And so he took a lot of courage to be able to write this and put this actually in print. Now, in verse 4, we find there's a, two colors that are mentioned. They're purple and scarlet. These colors are the same that's seen in the Vatican today. So the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup 
full of abominations and of the filthiness of her fornication. Now, this is an actual picture of the Vatican in session. I don't know if you can tell what colors are uh, predominant there. That's kind of an older picture. I've got a newer one here uh, coming up. There's another picture of this is the clergy there. But you can see the colors there are what two colors? Purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet. Same colors, purple and scarlet. Now, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4 tells that there's a golden cup full of fornication. Now, my next slide is a slide of a coin from the Vatican. And you know what? I've got this coin, and I forgot it at home today. And I was this morning, I said, man, I've got to remember to take that because I don't carry it with me all the time. I just carry it usually when I do this. But anyway, this is a picture of the front of it. This is Pope John the Twenty-Third. And this was uh, printed in, or it was minted in 1962. But what's interesting is you've got the Pope John the 23rd on one side. He's the one that actually called Vatican II. That really, that really got the ecumenical movement really moving forward. The next slide is the reverse side of it. <clears throat> now I want you to notice. Here's a woman. What's she got in her hand? She's got a cup. What's coming out of the cup? The sun. He's got sun rising out of it. In her left hand, she has a cross. Now, under her feet is a word. What do you see? What does that feet? What does it say there? It says Fides. Fides. Fides was the goddess of trust and good faith in Roman paganism. She was one of the original virtues to be considered an actual religious divinity. Okay? Now, I want you to notice what's going on. Now, she's got the sun coming out of the cup, that sun worship. She's got the cross in her other hand, okay? And that just shows exactly what Rome has done. They have blended together paganism, tried to blend together paganism with Christianity. But my question is simply this. Why would the leader of the so-called largest Christian church on the planet, on the back of the coin commemorating his pontificate, have a pagan goddess? If anybody can make sense out of that, I really would like to know. I wouldn't want anything pagan on anything that's attached to my name. But there it is, right there, right in front. I would try to, no, I can't bring it tomorrow night because it's at home. You know what? You guys have to remember, remind me, I'll bring it in September. <laughs> I'll show you. Uh, you can actually buy these coins. You can actually buy the coins if you're interested. So the golden cup of wine in her hand, I'm back to Revelation 17, uh, actually represents intoxication of false doctrine. Verse 4 says, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So how in the world can a church... I mean, I understand how individuals can commit fornication, but how can a church commit fornication? Well, James gives us a clue on that. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself what? An enemy of God. Now, adultery is a word meaning illicit sex. Fornication is illicit sex outside of marriage. And so in this case, we're talking about an illicit union. It was by departing from the Lord and forming an alliance with the heathens, adopting their pagan doctrines and practices, that a church commits fornication. And the papal church has done this very thing. In fact, it sought the support of pagan nations. In that process, they, support, they adopted their customs, their doctrines. We saw that especially under Constantine. In fact, it was in the days of Constantine that church and state blended together, they actually united together. Uh, in fact, many historians have identified these facts of history. In Bible commentary by Fawcett and Brown says, state and church are precious gifts of God, but the state being desecrated becomes beast-like the church apostatizes and becomes the harlot. Uh, this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica article on Constantine. It says, paganism must still have been an operative belief with the man. He was at best only half heathen, half Christian, who could seek to combine the worship of Christ with the worship of Apollo, the child of the sun god, having the name of the one and the figure of the other impressed upon his coins. Those are, that's a sample of Constantine's coins. <clears throat> Development of Christian doctrines, as we're told by Eusebius, that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it the outward ornaments to which that had been accustomed in their own. You see what he did? He says, if you can make it real similar, they're more likely to accept it. And that's what he was, that's what he was doing. Uh, church history says Christianity became an established religion in the Roman Empire and took the place 
of paganism, Christianity as it existed in the Dark Ages, might be termed baptized paganism. And paganism abounds in the Catholic faith and practices today. Back to Dave Hunt's book on page 420. <clears throat> he says, visiting the cemeteries in Rio de Janeiro on any religious holiday, one finds the Catholic faithful there petitioning the spirits of their ancestors along with the Catholic saints. In Brazil and Cuba, Spiritism and voodoo-related African religions of various kinds blend with Catholicism, and throughout Latin America, native superstitions remain among Catholics. Why is this thing not working? He said, the uses of images, holy water, and many of the rituals now part of Catholicism have been adapted from paganism. He said, one finds every shade of new age, occult and mystical belief inside the Roman Catholic Church itself. Catholic world had an entire issue affirming the new age movement without a word of condemnation, condemnation or correction. Thousands of priests and nuns practice yoga and other forms of Hindu or Buddhist mysticism. Catholic schools across the country are permeated with occult and new age methods as are the public schools. So the prophetic history, we're going to go into Revelation chapter 2 and 3 because the prophetic history of the church periods is given there. It's a very, very interesting prophecy. There are seven letters to seven churches that you will find there, and it covers the seven periods of church history. And each of these seven churches represents a different period of church history. In fact, these were literal churches in John's day. In fact, if you would follow the order of those churches in Revelation, it would be like a, a postal writer would have gone from place to place to place. And he'd make his round around there. But symbolically, like I said, they represent the various periods of Christian history. I'm not going to start at the very beginning, but he says this, I'm going to start with the Church of Pergamos. It says, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. I don't have time to go through the whole story of Balaam and Balak, but Balaam was a, a backslidden prophet yeah, that, that uh, he had been faithful to God at one time, and Balak offered him a huge sum of money if he would come and curse the children of Israel. And so when he came there to do that, Bala Balaam couldn't do it, and he would bless them instead, and Balak got all mad about him. But what Balaam ended up doing was going back, and he says, listen, as long as they're faithful to God, nothing can happen to them. But if you can seduce them, God will turn his back on them. He will withdraw his protection, and you'll have them. That was just before they were entered into the promised land, and there were thousands of them. I can't remember the exact number. Thousands of them died right then and there. <clears throat> Verse 15, he says, Thus you shall also, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, the church of Pergamos represented the historical church from 323 to 538 A.D. This was a time, it was a popular church. That was a, during this period that they courted paganism. And the false doctrines came in under Constantine, and they started blending these things together. Verse 14, of the second part of verse 14, said they would commit fornication. In verse 15, they had the doctrine, they held the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which he said, which thing I do what? He says, which thing I hate. And basically taught them they did not need to obey the law of God in the human traditions and replace the commandments of God. Both the fourth commandment was, was changed, the second commandment was tossed out. Now, the word Nicolaitan is an interesting word because Nico means ruler over, laeta is the people. So the laity or the, it, so they would be the ruler over the people. They had eliminated the priesthood of believers and established an earthly priesthood. The Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's no man or woman that has authority to stand between you and God. I don't care how well they can speak. I don't care how holy they think they are. No one has that authority because what's happening is you are taking away from Jesus what only belongs to him, okay? <clears throat> History of the Eastern Church, page 184, says the retention of the old pagan name of De Solis for Sunday is in a great measure 
owning to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day, not of the S-O-N, capital S-O-N, but the S-U-N. William Gladstone said the, doc, the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the human soul crept into the back door of the church in the early centuries. The Roman Catholic spokesman says dialogue with the dead is feasible. Reverend Gino Concetti, he is a Vatican theologian, he says communication is possible between those who live on this earth and those who live in a state of eternal repose in heaven or in purgatory. Well, the next church period speaks of the great reign of the papal church. That would be from 538 down to 798. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to begin there in verse 18. He says to the angel of the church in Thyatira, Write these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman. Have you ever had known anybody ever named their daughter Jezebel? Yeah, I mean, Jezebel was not exactly a highly respected woman in the, in the Bible. He says, but because you allow that woman Jezebel, so that, that idea or the personage, not the literal person, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And so notice again in Thyatira, sexual immorality or fornication. So what are some of the false doctrines that came in during that time? Well, sprinkling came in instead of baptism by immersion, Sunday worship instead of Sabbath keeping, idol worship with the use of images and things where, you know, people, they burn candles and stuff to these images and they pray to these various saints. And also the Pope is God and tradition instead of the Bible. <clears throat> but I want you to notice, I mentioned those who commit fornication or adultery with her. That's verse 22. In verse 23, it says, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And so he says he would, he would kill her children, and all the churches then would know. Now, remember what we read in chapter 17 of Revelation and verse 5. It says, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So she has children. She has daughters. They're daughters of the harlot. And a woman has a family name. That family name is Mystery Babylon. So what is that? Well, it's not ancient Babylon. Ancient Babylon lasted from 605 to 538 B.C. And the Bible said that it would never again be inhabited. So what would it be then? Well, verse 18 tells us, And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so it, this is a spiritually named city. Now, some people think it's literal. In fact, there's a book that was just recently put out, The Rise of Babylon, that they, they were claiming that this was all going to come back in. Going, even though the Bible totally contradicts this. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me how this is kind of getting off the path. It's kind of a hobby horse that I get on once in a while. But, you know, you, you, you read the paper. You reopen up the paper and say, well, how can I make the Bible fit this today? And because of, remember in Desert Storm, the, the reports are coming back that we're going to have, you know, boatloads of bodies coming back from there that Saddam Hussein was going to win and Babylon was back. You know, the, Saddam Hussein was in the process of rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. He was. But you know what happened? Desert Storm came in and he came to the end of his rope. That was the end of it. And Babylon is still laying in ruins. You know why? Because the Bible says it will never be inhabited again, that it's going to be a place for lizards and, and things like that. Babylon's never going to be inhabited. It's talking about a spiritual entity at the end of time. Okay? He says, now, <laughs> verse six, chapter 16, verse 19, it says, Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Okay, so it tells us that it was divided into three parts. Now, verse 13 tells us 
what those three parts are. Let's go back a few verses. It says, A great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And so you've got the dragon, that's the devil, and paganism, like ancient Rome with this paganistic uh, uh, worship system, the spiritualism that came out of that. The beast then would be Catholicism. But what about the false prophet? What would the false prophet be? False prophet is apostate Protestant Christianity. Remember when I told you that for every truth that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. He has a counterfeit. This is the devil's counterfeit. It's, it's, it's Satan's, it's his demonic trinity. It's a worldwide confederacy against the truth of God in the last days. Now, the word Babylon means confusion, and that originated at the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 9, it says, Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. When a baby is starting to talk, and you can't make any sense of what they're saying, what do we say they're doing? They're babbling. They're babbling. It goes all the way back. You know, one of the things that amazed me when I first started studying the Bible is how many phrases that we have that we use daily that came from the Bible. You know, they're just, it's just really amazing. <clears throat> the city of Babylon had its origin when God confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. Uh, the term Babylon in Revelation represents religious confusion. And folks, listen, Christianity and paganism combined, that is religious confusion. And I want you to notice that this is called mystery, Babylon the Great. God calls this modern religious system Babylon because it is a mixture of falsehoods and traditions of man. Now, Babylon was a center of image worship. That's, that was very big there. It was also a man-made system of religion. Now, the foundation of the Babylonian system was based on the authority of man. Okay, don't miss that. The authority of man, it was based on the word of man. It was also based on the works of man and the law of man, and the traditions of man. But God's system of truth is based on the word of God. So the foundation of the divine system was the authority of God and the authority of the word of God. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The love of God. God doesn't want us to, to follow him just because we have to. He wants us to follow him because we love him and that we want to be by him and we want to reflect who he is the law of God, and the teachings of God. Now remember, friends, this, woman, this mother woman is a mother of harlots. In Revelation chapter 17, now in verse 5, the Bible says, And on her forehead a name was written, Babylon the Great, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, of the abominations of the earth. So the woman has daughters, and they are the same as the mother. They are also referred to as harlots as well. So who would that be? The daughters are the churches who are doing the same thing as the mothers. So who, who, who are these daughters? What churches are these? They're the same ones that follow and get their teachings from the mother church at Rome, the ones that follow the very same doctrine today. In his book, Faith of Millions, on Sunday, he says some of the most prominent doctrines of Protestant churches are not in the Bible, brought in as they broke away from Rome during the Reformation. Things like Sunday keeping, Baptism of infants, baptizing infants, eternal torment. Eternal, you know, you, you, of any doctrine that's out there that, that really destroys the character that God has loved, it's the idea of eternal torment, and it's not in the Bible. It's simply not in the Bible. The state of the dead. All of these came from pagan doctrines that came into the Catholic Church, and as the Protestant churches broke away, they just carried a lot of that right with them out. In his book, The Faith of Millions by uh, John A. O'Brien, he said, but since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course, it is inconsistent, but this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. And by that time, the custom was universally observed. They have continued the custom, even though it does not rest upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance remains as a reminder of the mother church from the non-Catholic sects broke away 
from which a non-Catholic sex broke away, like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Now, we must look at some of the spiritual compromise that mark Christendom today. This is a heresy trial that was going on for ordaining a non-celibate gay. Another one here, newspaper articles, there's a number of them up here. Episcopalians grappling with questions of ordaining homosexuals of priesthood. Church shaken by report endorsing joy of sex. A human sexuality report stirring Presbyterians. Episcopal panel okays gay priests. Here's another one, Eros defined. Now this is an interesting one. If the Presbyterian Church USA approves a controversial statement on sexuality, it will more closely resemble a Canaanite fertility cult, cult than a Christian church. And this is, a, this is another one. This is uh, crossing over. Can a transsexual minister retain her ordination? And so at the same time, you see, he says, it's hard to surprise church trustees anymore. They know how to deal with divorced clergy or ministers plagued by a crisis of faith. They're slowly coming to terms with non-celibate homosexuals in a pulpit. They've learned to move swiftly against embezzlers and sexual abusers, but last week brought a novel problem. The issue before the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta was this. Since Erin Swenson had completed her transsexual trans medical procedures, could she retain the ordination she had received when she was Eric a man? So, you know, I mean, just think about this. He go, this, this individual goes through a sex change and wanted to continue as a pastor. So then Eric the man becomes Eric the woman? You know, I, and folks, listen, this stuff is going to be on YouTube, so there's things I can't say. <laughs> There's things I'm really limited to what I can say here. Anglican and church leaders agree to Anglican and Catholic church they agree to eventual union. What happened in Australia because one side was endorsing the immorality, then the other side says, listen, we're going to go with the Catholic church. And so they just switched allegiance there. Uh, this headline reads here, historic visit by the pontiff. Uh, listen to this. <clears throat> Pope John Paul II Sunday became the first Catholic leader to visit a Lutheran church 462 years after excommunicated German priest Martin Luther split the Catholic Church. The Pope stressed unity during the nationally televised visit to a Lutheran church in his own diocese of Rome. The Lord that calls us, this is his quote, the Lord that calls us in our days through ecumenical dialogue in the search for full Christian unity, he said in German, notwithstanding all our still evident separations in doctrine and life, we feel profoundly united in this time of Advent in the solidarity of all Christians. We desire unity, we work for unity. This is a newspaper article talking about this. It says, Lutheran Catholics, Lutherans mend 462 year rift. Augsburg, Germany, 462 years ago Sunday, the blunt speaking monk Martin Luther nailed his legendary attack on Catholic church practices to a church door in Germany, an act of conscience that triggered the Protestant Reformation. Sunday, October 31st, 1999, the era of that acrimony and fracture, the leaders of the modern Lutheran and Roman Catholic churches signed a document that officially settles the central argument about the nature of faith that Luther provoked. Now listen. The agreement declares, in effect, that the Protestant Reformation was all what? Misunderstanding. So the agreement is significant beyond the dispute over doctrine that it resolves, it has deep implication for future relations among Catholics and Protestants, said theologians and church leaders. It was all a misunderstanding. All a misunderstanding. Millions of people put to death. Oh, it was just a misunderstanding. Let me tell you something, guys. Rome has not changed its position. Rome cannot change its position. Because of papal infallibility, the Rome cannot go back against what they believe. What has changed is Protestantism. Protestantism has been steadily moving further and further and more back to Rome. Continuing on, many said this accord gives added promise to the ideal their denominations champ champion a full communion or merger between the churches. This is another article here was found in Crux Magazine. So nearly 500 years after Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door, the largest Lutheran denomination in the United States has approved a declaration recognizing there are no longer church dividing issues on many points with the Roman Catholic Church. 
The Declaration of the Way was the title of that uh, document, was approved 931 to 9 by the 2016 Evangelical Lutheran Church in America Churchwide Assembly held last week at the Ernest N. Memorial Convention Center in New Orleans. ELCA presiding Bishop Elizabeth, Elizabeth A. Eaton called the declaration historic in a statement released by the denomination following the August 10 vote, though we have not yet arrived, we have claimed that we are in fact on the way to unity, he said. The Declaration on the Way helps us to realize more fully our unity in Christ with our Catholic partners, but it also serves to embolden our commitment to unity with all Christians, Eaton said. The Declaration comes as the Lutheran and Catholic Church have prepared to kick off a year of celebrations to mark the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. That was just a few years ago, about five, maybe five years ago this fall. Luther had touched off the Reformation on October 31st, 1517, when he nailed the 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg, Germany. That document included 95 questions and propositions he wanted to debate within the Catholic Church. What that document was, there were 95 objections to what Luther saw were biblical positions that the church was going against in their, in their teaching. Now, he wanted to discuss that. He just wanted to have a dialogue about that. He never wanted to leave the church. He didn't want to split the church. He wanted the church to get back on a biblical foundation. And continue on, he said, most notably, the Declaration on the Way includes 32 statements of agreement where Lutherans and Catholics no longer have church dividing differences on issues of church, ministry, and the Eucharist. Those statements previously had been affirmed by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs. It also lists remaining differences between the two churches and next steps on addressing them. Eaton pointed to past agreements reached by the ELCA and the Catholic Church as well, including 1999's Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. Now, last November, Post Francis sparked a controversy when he seemed to suggest that Lutheran could receive communion in the Catholic Church, saying life is greater than explanations and interpretations. Pontiff is scheduled to visit Sweden on October 31st to preside at a joint service with Lutherans. And the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation released a joint document in 2013 titled From Conflict to Communion that focused on the progress made in Lutheran Catholic dialogue in the past 50 years rather than centuries of conflict. Now, the ELCA, the Evangelical, Luther, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, is one of the 10 largest Protestant denominations in the United States with more than 3.7 million members across the 50 states and the Caribbean region. This is from Ralph Reed's Politically Incorrect. <clears throat> he says, as perhaps the most encouraging is a new ecumenism that permeates a pro-family community. The union of Roman Catholics and conservative Prost Protestants could have a greater impact on American politics than any coalition since African American Jews came together during the civil rights movement. He said, major turning point, this is from page 14. He said, a major turning point in this new coalition occurred in March 1994 when a group of Catholic and Protestant leaders signed a historic declaration entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together, led by Chuck Colson of Prison Fellowship and Father Richard John Newhouse, a Catholic theologian. 39 religious leaders pledged to work together to redress hostility towards religion on the broader culture, in the broader culture. Among the signatories, John Cardinal O'Connor, Pat Robertson, Bill Bright with Campus Crusade for Christ, and Richard Lane of the Southern Baptist Convention. This uh, headline reads, Common Cause Causes Unite Catholics and Evangelicals. This is an article here is Truth Stranger Than Fish, and the subtitle says, Catholics and Evangelicals Find Common Ground. This is uh, it says, uh, an emerging an emerging partnership of Catholics and evangelical Protestants is going to be the most powerful force in the electorate beyond the 90s, and anybody who tries to ignore that alliance will make a big mistake. Catholics and Southern Baptists join in history-making conversation. He believes, he says very clearly here, that someday Catholics and Baptists might formally become one denomination. The next slide is, you guys remember Dr. Richter Schuler? Remember him in the Cathedral? Remember him? Listen to what he had to say. <clears throat> it is time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, the Pope, and say, what do we have to do to come home? Here we see the Pope as man of the year and confident to world leaders. <clears throat> These are pictures of the various world leaders. You've got Obama, Trump, uh, Vladimir Putin. 
Vladimir Putin, I don't know. You know, that one is, that's always been strange to me how he went and met with the, uh, with the Pope there. You know, folks, listen, this great ecumenical movement to bring everybody back to Rome, that's all Babylon. It's all Babylon. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 2 says, With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Verse 18 says, And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. You know what's something, just kind of a little bit of trivia here. Before we went into Iraq, George Bush talked to the Pope to get his permission. Interesting thing. You know that the Vatican, I know I've told you this before, the only church on this planet that we have an ambassador to is the Vatican. Ronald Reagan did that. I remember when that was happening. Melody and I wrote, we wrote to our, 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 our representatives, said, hey, what are you guys doing? You, you can't do this to a church. I mean, it, yeah, this, there needs to be the separation here. And we got a letter back from them. Basically, it said, dear Mr. and Mrs. Dum Dum, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I want you to notice why this is so important to know. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4. So I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. You see, God has people in all these churches, but the churches are going too far. And so God says they need to come out. And the reason they need to come out is because the plagues are going to fall on Babylon. And he says, I don't want you in there because if you're in there, the plagues are going to fall on you. And don't miss it. You see, you don't have to worry about the plagues if we come out, if we are not in spiritual Babylon. Now, the seven last plagues are detailed in Revelation chapter 16. This is the final manifestation of God's displeasure before Jesus comes. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 16. I'm going to begin reading there in verse 1. And I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of, bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So I the first went out and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So, you see why it's important not to receive the mark of the beast? Because, you see, the plagues are not going to fall on the people who have, have been sealed by God. It's only going to fall on those who have the mark of the beast. And so the vials of wrath are, they go out upon the earth and them that have the mark of the beast. So we had just read about sores. The second one <clears throat> is the sea turning into blood. So then a second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became the blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. The third plague is the rivers would turn to blood. And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. So why would the waters be turned to blood? Because they shed the blood of God's faithful. And the scorching sun is the fourth, uh, fourth plague to come on there, verses 8 and 9. So then a fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Why? Why would the, the heat of the sun, why would that become so intense? Because they worshiped it. And how did they do that? By keeping the false Sabbath of the Antichrist. That's the day of the sun. Notice Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And he said, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, verse 2 says, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on a sea of glass, having harps of God. And so here those receive the plagues are contrasted with those who have the victory over the beast and his mark. Of course, we studied what the mark was. We studied what the mark was. When, when Sunday legislation comes in, that's when the mark of the beast, the people will be receiving the mark of the beast. They will either accept it or they're going to reject it. So they're either going to get the seal of God or they're going to get the mark of the beast. Now, folks, I want you to notice they're called the seven last plagues. The implication is that there had to be some first plagues. Remember in ancient Egypt, 
Remember in ancient Egypt? See, the, 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 the plagues at the end are very similar to the plagues at the plagues of Egypt, I should say, are very similar to the plagues at the end of the world. In fact, the whole episode and experience is very, very much the same. In Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1, <clears throat> It says, afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, pay attention to this verse as I'm, look, I'm showing you. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, before I go any further, what was Israel's position down in Egypt? How long? Long time. Yeah, 400 years. They were, they were, they were in slavery. So the whole issue that was going over was worshiping and obeying God, and it all centered on them keeping the Sabbath day. Let's continue on. <clears throat> you remember the Passover? You remember the whole Passover there? They had to apply the blood. Folks, listen, that's the same thing of us. If we do not have the blood applied to the lentils of our heart, you see, the angel of death will not pass over us. We have to have. We have need to be covered with Jesus' blood. The angel of death will pass right over us. Let's go to verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And so they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please, let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. You see, they knew that they had been living outside of God's will, of God's protection. And they knew that they had to get back right with God or there would be repercussions for it because now they were coming into a full knowledge of what God wanted them to do. And verse 5 says, And Pharaoh said, Look, the people are the, of the land are many now, and you make them do what? You see what happened? They started keeping the Sabbath. In fact, that word, their rest, is Shabbat. You can't make this stuff up. That was the issue. That was the issue. God, he said, no, we're going to get back right with God. We're going to start living the way God wants us to live. And Pharaoh said, no way. And so what did he do? He just heaped the work on them so that they couldn't be able to keep the Sabbath. You follow me? But what happened? The Bible says God brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. In fact, by, by Egypt's refusal, by their refusal, it destroyed them. It destroyed them. They were decimated for a long time after that. We remember they had to make the uh, same number of bricks, but now there was an ingredient that was kept out. Yeah, they, were, they weren't to get the straw, because straw is what binds it together. Verses 16 and 17, they began rest on the Sabbath from their burden so they could worship the Lord and serve him again. But Pharaoh rebelled against the truth and the worship of God, and so the Lord began sending those plagues. And God called Israel out of the pagan surroundings, the sun worship of Egypt, to begin keeping the Sabbath to go then into the promised land. Remember the first thing that happened after, after their deliverance? God tested them again over the issue of Sabbath observance with the man. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 4. So the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'll rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will do what? Whether they're going to walk in my law or not. Verse 5, it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. You guys remember the story. We've talked about this, that if they tried to keep it any other day of the week, what would happen? Yeah, it'd get moldy, it'd get putrid, it'd, it'd stink, okay? But on Friday, on the preparation day, they could bring in twice as many, and that would last them for Friday and for Sabbath, so that Sunday they could go out and get a whole new uh, a whole new amount or a new allotment of that. Verse 26, he says, six days you shall gather, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, how much is there going to be? He said, there's going to be none. Now, it happened that some of the children of Israel disobeyed and they went out to gather the manna on the Sabbath. Listen to what God says to him in verse 28. He says, how long you refuse to keep my commandments and my law? Now, keep in mind, this is about a month before they received the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments were given in Exodus chapter 20. This is Exodus chapter 16. Now, I want you to understand a principle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul write, Now, all the... These things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, our instruction, our learning, on whom the ends of the ages have come. And so it was an example and admonition, especially to us, brothers and sisters, who are down here at the end of time. God sends a call out today in Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 6. 
He said, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in. You know, this everlasting gospel, friends, listen, the gospel has always been the same. There is no two gospels. Israel was not saved one way, and people are saved a different way today. God has always saved the same way. It's always been the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way anybody has ever been able to be saved. And so this idea that, well, Israel was saved by their works, and, you know, they had this, and they were saved by that, that's a bunch of nonsense. It's not biblical. Paul's very clear, the bullet, blood of bull and goats could not bring remission. Why? You can't, you know, if, if all you had to do was kill an animal, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. He just brought a perfect bull up there and nailed him to a cross. I mean, it just, this, some of this thinking is so just, it, you can tell it irritates me. <clears throat> <clears throat> He's had the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven the earth, and earth, the seas, and the springs of water. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And so the first angel's message, we're living in the judgment hour, but the message is to worship the creator, worship God as a creator. And it actually uses a passage from the fourth commandment in these warning messages. You see, Sabbath observance is a memorial of the creator, but what do we hear now coming out of the Church of Rome? See, there's a cost. There's a cost to walking away from the commandments of God. There's a cost for saying that one doesn't mean anything anymore. Listen to what Rome says. You see, because denying the Sabbath has now caused the church to deny the Creator, and they've accepted evolution instead of creationism. Here's a quote <clears throat> from U.S. News and World Report, November 4th, 1996. Did God create mankind in his image, as the Bible says, or did humans evolve from animals, as Darwin theorized nearly 150 years ago? According to Pope John Paul II, evolution may be a better explanation. Folks, listen, I don't know about you, but I didn't come from any slime that was floating on a primordial pond somewhere where lightning struck it, and all of a sudden started sprouting feet and legs, got, a, got eyes and a tail, and climbed up on land. The tail fell off, and pretty soon it was making typewriters in New York City. <clears throat> you know, I mean, this is just, this, that's how ridiculous this is. The scientist was talking to a group of, of scientists, and he says, I know that according to the laws of probability, evolution is absolutely impossible. But if I admit that evolution is impossible, then I have to believe that somebody did it. And I'd rather believe in the possible than to believe that there's a God. The whole thing about evolution was to deny the existence of God. It wasn't science. It wasn't there to promote science. It was there to undermine the worldview that the Bible holds. Time Magazine, <clears throat> the Pope in Darwin, listen to this. In his message to a meeting of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which had taken the origin of life as its theme, the statement by John Paul reflects the church's acceptance of evolution. The statement is unlikely to influence Catholic schools where evolution has been taught since the 1950s. Indeed, reading the entire Bible literally has not been a dominant practice among Catholics through much of the 20th century. Peter Stavinsky's editor of the 1991 Catholic Encyclopedia says we should not interpret Genesis literally. Now, second angel's, angel's message warns of the fall of Babylon in verse 8. So another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And folks, churches have surely fulfilled Bible prophecy today. This is from uh, Fawcett and Brown, Jameson Fawcett and Brown, Bible Commentary. <clears throat> it says, the first justification of the woman is in her being called out of Babylon the harlot. When judgment is about to fall for apostate Christendom, Babylon is not to be converted, but to be destroyed. In every apostate and world-conforming church, there are some of God's invisible and true church who, if they would be safe, must come out. Revelation chapter 18, 4 is repeating this, only it adds an urgent request to this or an urgent appeal where it says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And so it those who are in Babylon must come out. His people must come out to truly worship him in the last days. Well, where do they go? 
If there's only truth and error, if that's, if that's a choice, where do they go? See, if God is calling you out of confusion, where would he want you to go? See, he's calling you out of error into his truth or out of Babylon into the remnant, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. You know, the night that followed the last day of the great battle of Gettysburg was a terrible night. I've, I've studied some fair amount of Civil War history. In the Battle of Gettysburg, in the three days that the Battle of Gettysburg were fought, more Americans were killed in those three days than the entire Southeast Asia conflict. Over 50,000. Over 50,000 dead and wounded were strewn over the battlefield. About nine o'clock that night, a little spot of light appeared over the field of battle. It was an old Quaker man with his lantern. He was out looking for his son, who was in the Union Army. As he went along with his lantern, he was looking into the face of the dead and the wounded, and every once in a while he would stop and call. He said, John Hartman, thy father calleth thee. Some poor boy nearby would say to himself, oh, I wish to God that were my father. He goes a little further, holds up the lantern, calls out again, John Hartman, thy father calleth thee. He hears men groaning and he hears men cursing. Suddenly way off in the distance, he hears a voice. It's a very weak voice. But you know, the ears of love are very keen. He hears a voice saying, here, Father, here. Father, over here, this way. At last, he finds his son. He goes over and removes a great pile of dead soldiers, gets down to his son, pulls him to his shoulders, and carries him home to home and healing. You know, my friend, your name may not be John Hartman, but whatever it is, your heavenly Father is calling you. He's calling you to come out of her, my people. My question for you this evening is, have you accepted his call? In John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus said, Another sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow him. My question, will you follow Jesus and heed his invitation to come out of Babylon so that you will not receive of her plagues. Folks, listen, we are living in tumultuous times. We're living in a time now where we can make those decisions. I don't believe it's going to be that far down the line when it's going to be very, very difficult to make those decisions. You know, there may be, there's always a cost. There's always a cost. And the Bible tells us where to count the cost. But there's always a cost for following Jesus. But I'm going to tell you something. The rewards for following Jesus far outweigh any of the cost that we incur while here, here. And so I encourage you to make that decision. In fact, you need to make that stand for Jesus and his truth. If we don't stand while times are relatively easy, we won't make it in the time that's extremely difficult. Now, if you've never been baptized, if you've never been baptized by immersion, if you've never been biblically baptized, um, I would ask that you would stand up here tonight and make a public declaration that you want to make that stand for Jesus. You want Jesus to be the very center. You're going to follow him regardless, regardless of where the world goes. If you've never done that, and I don't know, I don't know if I don't know where you are in your walk, but if you've never been baptized biblically, then I would say, stand to your feet now, because I want to pray for you tonight. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Stay standing. Stay standing. I'm going to, be, I'm going to have a prayer here. If you've learned new truth, if you've learned new truth and you want to come through and you say, I want to be rebaptized, I want to start afresh, I want to have a clean start with Jesus, I'd ask that you'd stand to your feet right now too, because I want to pray for you too. Because I'm going to tell you something, guys, the devil's going to be coming after you. He comes after all of us. He comes after me all the time. But we need to know that we're on the right side in this battle. Now, if you've been biblically baptized, you want to join with, with what the Bible calls God's remnant, I ask you to stand because you can come in by profession of faith. And you want to make that decision. I want to be with God's people here at the end. I don't want to be on the outside. I want to be on the inside. If that's your wish, I'm going to ask that you would get to your feet right now because I'm not going to hold this out for very long. But you stand to your feet now because I want to pray for all of you. We are in serious times. Let's pray. Father, 
Father, angels in heaven are rejoicing here this evening. Oh, you see, all these individuals have stood to their feet because they are making a commitment to follow you. Father, it's not always easy, but the way of the wicked is so much harder. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you will bless them in a special way, that you will continue to lead and continue to guide them. Father, I pray you continue to lead and to guide all of us. But Father, on these that are standing here this evening, I just pray that you move, continue to move on their hearts in a very special way. Continue to lead, continue to guide. And Father, may every person, may every person who has heard this appeal, every person who's listened to this message here tonight, there are people out there listening, I don't even know all where they are. But Father, those are people that have given their hearts to you here tonight as well. Father, bless them. Bless and guide Father, we look to you for the answers of life. We look to you for the answers, the solutions to the world that we live in. Because this world, Father, you are coming back to establish a whole new system. And Father, we look forward to that. Father, bless us now as we go from here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have we have snacks downstairs. Yeah, we have snacks downstairs. Listen, good night. God bless. Tomorrow night, our subject is going to be, who's got it? The most sought after secret in the world. <laughs> and the Bible revealed. Listen, I'll see you downstairs in just a little bit. <clears throat>